Well, good morning, everybody. I was telling him in first service that I was so frustrated with myself for canceling service a couple weeks ago um, with less snow than what we had today that I came down yesterday and shoveled because if I had to shovel it all by myself, I was going to make sure we had church today because I did not want to cancel again. But I want to thank everybody that did show up. Uh, there were a couple of folks that helped me out yesterday, and we had a handful of people come this morning before first service to help Brother Joey out. And I just thank you guys that you have that heart of service to make sure that we can have church even on the snowiest of days. And I am going to have a long conversation with the Lord today about it being March and it's snowing this much. I am not a happy camper. I was telling Nathan before first service that in March my mind turns toward baseball, which turns toward summer, which means we should not be dealing with snow. But, yeah, we pastor a church in the Sierras, so I guess that gives me my answer. Anyway, I just wanted to thank everybody for last week. It was an amazing service. I think Pastor Brett, um, past gave an amazing message, not just for me, but for you all as well, that um, I was just so grateful for everybody that came out and for the volunteers that made sure we had food and that served us well after service last week. A few weeks ago, I preached a message entitled, Who Are You or Who Am I? And I was talking about the identity crisis that the church seems to be undergoing of not understanding who they are in Christ and how we learned in that message that we are co-heirs with Christ, we're children of God, we're sons and daughters of God, sons and daughters of the King of kings and Lord of lords, but yet we live thinking ourselves less than instead of those that have the authority that Jesus says, I'm giving you all authority before I go to my Father. And then he said he's even given us even something better, which was the gift of the Holy Spirit, which that same Spirit that lived on the inside of us is that same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. So we have power, we have authority, we have a Father that is all-powerful and backs us up. It says in the Bible, if God is for us, who can be against us? But yet we live like we're less than. We live in fear. We live in anxiety and anxiousness instead of just putting our faith and trust that the God of heaven and earth, the creator of this world, loves us individually and intimately and wants to have a relationship with us so that we can live the victorious Christian life. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to have a bed of roses from the time we give our life to Christ until we go to heaven. And if any preacher taught you that, he was selling you a bill of goods. Because yeah. Jesus said in his word that in this life we will have trouble, but for us to take heart that he's overcome this world. And so we have to live in that confidence that even during the most difficult times of our life that God is with us and he's for us. And his word says that he works all things together for our good. So we have to have that mindset of who we are and whose we are in Christ. But today I want to talk to you about why am I? Or why are you? Why are we here? Why were we created? You see, it's one thing to understand who we are, but then we have to understand why we are who we are. And I've looked in the Bible for several years because this question always kind of plays in my mind is why is this world created? Why did God decide to do this? And it takes me all the way back to the book of Genesis that says that He created us to bring Him glory. Amen. And not just us. He created the world to glorify Him. We look at the majesty of the mountains, something about standing on the beach and listening to the waves and seeing the vastness of the sea and God receiving glory from just nature being around us. I grew up on the border of Mexico in the desert in Southern California. And the only running water I ever saw, other than in a faucet, I'm talking about water, was in an irrigation ditch or a canal. So when I go to the mountains and I see a stream or I see a river, 
I could stare at it for hours and just thank God for the beauty of His creation because you feel deprived of it in one area of your life and then all of a sudden you move to this area. I even give Him glory for this stinking snow that's out there. It is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen and it is the most tedious thing I've ever done to shovel snow. And I thought I moved out of Portola so I wouldn't have to do it anymore and here God is bringing it to Reno for me to have to do here as well. But I give Him glory anyway. <laughs> right? Can't do anything about it. We might as well. But today I want to talk about the reason God created us and redeemed us. Amen? Amen. So what is... Why does the church exist? Why do we as Christians exist? And we probably all have a list of some things that we can think of off the top of our head. And I listed a few things out and they might be on your list. One, we think, well, we were created to bring the gospel to the lost. That's, that's a good thing. We're to bring hope to the hurting. That's a good thing. We were created to get married. It's a good thing. Real good thing. We were created to prepare our children to have good lives and prepare them for the world that they're going to face when they leave our home. We think we were created to solve our pain and our problems in our life. We think that we were created to have a comfortable life. But these are just some of the benefits or what I call side effects of life. But it's not the purpose of our life. They're good things, but they're not the very purpose of life. And sometimes we find ourselves chasing the side effects of life instead of chasing our purpose in life. You see, our purpose in life is to glorify God. Are all the decisions that we make, are all the actions that we take glorifying God? And that's where we need to get to. And uh, I don't want you guys to think, oh, Pastor Greg's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. Yes, we live in this world and we live in this earth, but we belong to a different kingdom. And so our mindset has to change into what am I allowing in my life? Is it glorifying God? What am I allowing in my body? Does it glorify God? What am I allowing through my eye holes? What am I allowing through my ear holes? Is it glorifying God? You see, these are decisions that take effect on your spirit within you. You can live more powerfully spiritually if we feed our spirit more than we allow our flesh to have what it wants. And I've been teaching that for several weeks now. I heard a pastor one time preach the same sermon for about six weeks in a row. The church board finally asked him, when are you going to preach a new message? And he says, when you start living the one I've been preaching for the last six weeks. I'm not saying that to you guys. I'm just reminding you, okay? I'm just reminding you that what we allow into our lives is either going to feed our spirit or it's going to feed our flesh. And we have to be the gatekeeper for that. You see, sometimes we get the wrong motivation in life. In today's world, we've shifted from the very purpose of glorifying God towards finding ourselves. I told you a few weeks ago, you know, I had some friends that had a little bit of money, and so they went off to find themselves. Some of them went to Europe, some of them just traveled around the States, but they went to find themselves. I asked my dad if I could go find myself, and he told me to go find a job. That's how I could find myself. But we put the wrong motivation into finding this life that we live. We put so much into it, and I am guilty. I guarantee you I'm guilty. I've chased money and jobs and career because I thought that was the purpose of life, to provide a home and provide cars. Yes, the Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat, but that can't be the focus of our life. You see, the focus of our life is to chase the one who blesses, not to chase the blessings. When we chase the blessings, we get completely absorbed into that effort and we leave God off to the side. We still worship Him, we still believe in Him, we still pray to Him, but then we find ourselves praying for the things we want. It's like, I want a new car. I want a million dollars. 
we, we end up asking him for things we want instead of asking him for the things that we need because the Bible says he'll provide for our needs, not for our wants. Right. Now, the Bible says if we chase after him, he'll give us some of the desires of our heart. But those aren't necessarily wants. We place more value on solving our problems and avoiding pain in this life. See, we want a comfortable life. But Jesus didn't call us to a comfortable calling. The life of Christ is not comfortable because we'll never fulfill our calling in God within our comfort zone. You see, I am not comfortable getting up here and talking in front of you guys every week. But yet he's called me to do it and I'm going to do it in his power, not in mine. You see, sometimes we study the Bible, we read Christian books, we attend seminars, we listen to sermons to discover a plan that will produce a result that sounds like this. A verse a day will keep the devil away. It's not that simple. You see, we have to completely surrender our life to Christ. We can't just read a verse a day and say we're good. We can't just pray over our food and say our nighttime prayers and be good. Our focus and our purpose has to be in glorifying God with our lives. Since we had a little bit of weather today and we had... Um, things going on. I didn't get my slides uh, taken care of, and that's my fault, nobody else's fault. So I'm going to ask you to go old school with me and turn in your Bibles. Or if you want to be new school, open your Bible on your phone or your tablet. And let's look at Isaiah chapter 43, verse 7. Give me an amen when you get there. There was one of you. Isaiah 43 says, Everyone who is called by my name, whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made, for his glory we were created. You see, after three years, you guys might know I'm a sports fan. And I like to use sports in a lot of my messages, and you guys probably have heard that a few times over the last few years. But I talk about how Players today play more for the name on the back of their jersey than the name on the front of their jersey. Now, for those of you that aren't sports related, usually the name on the front of your jersey is the name of your team. And the name on the back of your jersey is your name. And I look back at Psalm 23 and it talks about how he leads us in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake, not for my name's sake. So when I look at the front of my jersey, I see it says God's team. When I look at the back of my jersey, it says Pastor Greg. Whose glory am I living for? Am I feeding my flesh and living for the glory of Pastor Greg? Or am I feeding my spirit and living for the glory of God? You're going to find that I use sports a lot and I use marriage a lot. Because those are the two things I have a large sample size of. In my life. But the benefits of life are not the highest value. It is not the reason for living, but it should drive us back to Him as the reason for living. The very purpose of our life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. You see, we got to talking about it in our going deeper is our goal is to enjoy Him forever, which means we have a life beyond this life. When I first got saved, I used to serve God because of a fear of going to hell. Growing up in old time Pentecost, they used that really good. I came up with a slogan or a phrase or whatever you want to call it, that Jesus didn't come to scare the hell out of people. He came to love the hell out of people. The church became very good at trying to scare the hell out of people, trying to scare you into a relationship with Christ. But Jesus doesn't want us to love Him because we're scared of going to hell. He wants us to love Him because He loved us so much that even when we were still sinners, He went to that cross for you and me. And we talked about it in going deeper after the first service that 
if you spend your time living on the edge of sin, that you're looking back toward, am I doing enough to keep from going to hell? But if you are fully committed and your purpose is to glorify God, you're living to glorify God, not to stay out of hell. You're living because God loved you so much that He sent His Son to die for you. You're not living because you're afraid you're going to go to hell. I grew up with that mentality and it, it caused a lot of fear in my life. And I've told you guys the stories of having dreams of um, my family on an escalator going up and me on an escalator going down. When my parents didn't come home at the exact time they said they were going to come home, I started calling other people in the church to make sure I didn't miss the rapture. You know, it's like that's the kind of fear I grew up with. And when I became an adult and I started studying the Word, I started to understand that God wants me to love Him because He loves me, not because I'm afraid of what He'll do to me. Amen. Our greatest pleasure in life should be getting to know Jesus. Let's look at Psalm... 115, verse 1. It says, not to us, Lord, not to us, but to your name be glory because of your love and your faithfulness. You see, turning from self-passion to the passion of knowing God is our purpose in life. And our deepest desire will be, Father, glorify your name, not my name. Too often we live for our own wants and desires in this life instead of the highest calling and the fulfillment of our individual needs being in Him and not in whatever we chase in this life. And it's sad that many Christians are just covered up with this kind of teaching. You see the early church as an ambassador of Christ taught that the chief end of people is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And the modern church too often teaches that the chief end is to gratify ourselves or for God to gratify us, to give us what we want instead of what we need. You see, this life, we can express our faith in God and our trust in God in three ways, and the first is in prayer. You see, I don't want to pray just to check it off my list that I prayed today. I want to pray because I want to spend time in the presence of God. I want to pray because I was created See, Adam and Eve were created to walk with God in the garden and He came every afternoon and He had relationship with them. See, we think of God as this far off deity that doesn't have a desire to want to be with us. We think that He's up there checking off demerits against us for every time we do something wrong when all He wants is just to spend time with us and for us to spend time in His presence. Because it's in His presence that we're changed into the people that He's called us to be. The second thing is dedication. You see, we partner with God when we decide to follow Him and when we choose to make Him the chief purpose of our life. We partner with Him in our dedication to Him. He sees it in our obedience to His Word and our obedience of His commandments. And He takes us from victory to victory. Do we have problems in life? Yes, we have problems in life. But He takes us from victory to victory, from glory to glory, when we're obedient and we do what His Word says. It says if we love Him, we'll keep His commandments. Amen. So we show our love for God and our belief in God and our focus in glorifying Him by being obedient and by being dedicated to the work of Christ. You see, God doesn't want us to just come, hear His Word, and then walk away and act like we never heard the Word. God wants us to be a true reflection of who He is, so when people see us, they see God in us. That's what being a disciple of God is, is becoming more like Him every day. Becoming less like the world. You see, we all want to fit in. We all want to have our friends still like us and love us, even though we're Christians and we know they're not. We still kind of participate. We put our toe in the water over there so we don't look different from the world. 
We don't sound different from the world, but God called us to be a peculiar people set apart to reflect His glory. The third thing is to trust Him. Trust is to be with the whole people of God. It's not just for the individual, but for us as a whole to trust God to take this church from the place that is to the place it wants to be. God's coming back for a glorious church. I don't think we've achieved glorious yet, but we can achieve it by being faithful to Him and putting our faith and trust in Him. We shouldn't think of prayer and dedication as an individual matter. They should go hand in hand. You see, we shouldn't just want to pray. We shouldn't just want to spend time in His presence because it's something we have to do. But we should want to do it because we love Him and because He loves us and because when we do it, we hear things from heaven that we never heard before. I know a lot of you out there have been praying for some things for a long time and you're like, why is God silent? Why isn't He hearing me? But sometimes all we do is spend our time throwing requests at Him instead of just sitting and listening to what His Holy Spirit wants to say to us. That's why sometimes God is silent because you're not listening. Prayer is sometimes just sitting in silence and allowing God to speak to your heart instead of just vain repetitions and things that we think He wants to hear or things that we want but aren't necessarily for our good. Amen? Amen. As believers, we're asked to make the nearness of the Lord evident to people. You see, the people who don't serve God, they think of God as this far off deity that is just judging us and punishing us or doing all these things, but the nearness of God is within our reach. We feel it when we come into these altars. We feel it when we come into this house and we know the presence of God is here. Like I explained earlier, that spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is on the inside of each and every one of us and, our, and His presence is just as far away as us laying down our life before Him. It's as close as us just reaching out and asking Him, Lord, I want to be in Your presence. Lord, I want to feel You today. You know, we keep inviting Him and we keep inviting Him and we keep saying, Lord, come. Holy Spirit, come. He's here, but we just have to <laughs> surrender Get rid of all the stuff of this world that is distracting you and just put your focus on Him and He's as close. He says He'll never leave us or forsake us. He sticks closer than a brother. Jesus is close. God, His presence is here. It's close. We can have it in our prayer closet at home. We can have it in our car on the way to work. We can have it when we come to the house of God. But this isn't the only place that we feel the presence of God. I know I preached longer in first service, but if you're out there, worship team, if you'd come back. We have to realize that prayer and time in the Word is not because of duty. It's because we want to talk to God. It's because we want to be in His presence. Our human effort should not be the motivation, but the desire to know Him. According to Paul, getting to know Christ is to count everything that we've gained as loss. You see, Paul was a very educated man. I know people that go to school for years and accumulate doctorates and PhDs and master's degrees. And those aren't bad things. I'm not preaching against that's education. Education is an amazing thing, but it can't be our focus. Our focus is to do the things that give glory to God. If our passion is to know Christ more, Bible study and going to church become more important. I always say that when... Bible study becomes the most important or prayer meeting becomes the most important meeting in your church. That's when change comes.
every third Friday we do a prayer and worship night. We don't do that just because we want to open the doors, heat the building, and run the electricity for a couple hours. We do that because prayer is important and corporate prayer as a body is important for us to come together, pray for each other, lift up each other, support each other in our needs, pray for our requests that are before us, to pray for the purpose and the vision of this church, pray for the provision and the leadership of this church. It's so important that we are in unity when it comes to prayer. The leadership team just finished reading a book called His House, His Presence. And if you want to look that up on Amazon, I'd love you to read it with us. But our goal in coming to God's house is to experience His presence. And the only way that we can truly experience His presence is to enter into His presence through prayer. That's the door in which we come into His presence. The motivation in a Christian life is to know Christ and glorify Him. We can't count our works as the end of ourselves. The Bible says that faith without works is dead, but I tell you, works without faith is even doesn't even get you started. Amen. We get so excited, we want to do something for God. But unless it's His will... And it's what He wants us to do. Most times we're going to find it failing. To glorify God is to desire to make clear and visible to all people the nearness and the overwhelming power and authority and goodness of the Holy One. God is so good. I've seen Him over my years in His service just I don't know if I underestimate him or whether I just think that he isn't interested in my problems or and then I see his hand move and I see mountains taken out of my way that I didn't see any way that I could get through them and all I could do is just be in awe of who he is and give him glory and give him honor and that should be our purpose when we come into the church and it should be our purpose in life. Amen. When you go to work this week and you have to make a decision, ask yourself, is this going to glorify God? When you sit down on your couch at night and turn on the television, is this going to glorify God? I get convicted myself because I like country music. But does it glorify God? <laughs> well, I'll tell you guys, most of my sermons, I'm preaching more to myself than I'm preaching to you. Because the Holy Spirit wants me to share with you what He's sharing with me. Amen. Thank you. But to accomplish this goal of glorifying God in all that we do, we have to renounce ourselves of pride, knowledge, privilege, and rights. You see, this is a nation that thinks we have a right. But if you are a true sacrifice, a sacrifice has no rights. If we live our lives as a living sacrifice to God, we have no rights. But in order for us to give up our rights to Him, we have to understand that He has our best interests at heart. And that He will make all things work together for our good. Do you trust Him that much? Do you trust God? That you can truly surrender everything in your life. Everything that you're focused on. Everything that you're doing. Do you trust Him enough to put it on the altar?
our devotion should be to know God. We ought to pray because we want to know Him more and we ought to be under the teaching of His Word because we want to know Him more.